So <clears throat> let's move ahead to the section where it says now cultivators. So last week we finished up on confusion gives rise to karma. So Hanshan continues in his uh, essay, his letter, and he says, now cultivators, or it could be singular, and it could be addressed just to the person who wrote the uh, letter, or he could have switched over. Chinese does not indicate always plural or singular. Generally, it doesn't say that. So it could be now he's addressing him as a cultivator. and. This is important. Um, it's a uh, Xu Xingren, that's the uh, Chinese characters. And when he's doing this, he's putting him into um, a specific category. He's not just talking to someone who's intellectually curious, uh, nor someone who is sort of faith based and uh, just relying on uh, association with the temple or doing good deeds uh, to generate merit. This Xu Xing Ren is, is, is a reference for someone who's actually taking up the direct methods of practice that Buddha's Bodhisattva sages use. It, it's, it's direct experience. It's guided um, self-transformation. Uh, it's work. It's the real spiritual exercises that he's doing. So that's what cultivators mean. So he's talking to him now about if you're going to be this, if you're going to take up these tools, um, you really have to pay attention to your attitude, how you're going about it. Because the methods themselves don't deliver, uh, don't um, produce um, the awakening, but rather it's the mind with which you use them. Uh, and so your attitude is here everything. The, the right method in the wrong hands becomes a wrong method, and conversely, a seemingly wrong method with the right attitude and state of mind can be um, a proper method. So here he's really a pain, he's really going into why are you meditating, why are you cultivating, what are you after here? Um, and you have to be really right on. Uh, the Shrangama Sutra also talks about this. It says, when you begin this practice, your mind, your heart has to be as straight and true as lute strings, and uh, you have to be as pure as glistening frost. It means you have to have no ulterior motives, uh, no uh, manipulation going on internally or externally, and you can't be seeking or craving or yearning for anything. Uh, now, of course, he's talking about a combination here. So, in the first sense, he says, be single-minded. Um, meaning bring all your attention to this one issue, this one method that you're practicing. Um, this is a requirement. You, you cannot let your mind be hot and cold, wander here, wander there, come back to it. You won't penetrate. And often the metaphor that's used here is using a drill to, um, a fire stick drill to generate fire. If you, if you don't keep at it, if you don't keep at it, you don't generate enough heat that it creates the friction that creates the fire. So single-mindedly here means you really are serious about this and you're really going to do it. Um, and let go of all worldly concerns. So on, on one hand, he's saying to really do this, you have to do a little uh, jettisoning of things in your life that are weighing you down, uh, that are in the way of your spiritual cultivation, uh, that are impediments, either seemingly imposed on you from without, which is kind of tricky because very little is actually. Uh, most of it's invited uh, or held on to. Uh, but more specifically, the things we pick up ourselves that obstruct our practice. So he's saying be single-minded, let go of all your worldly concerns, and then on the third stage, now 
hold or attend to your meditation topic and keep advancing, meaning keep on that meditation topic, keep up the practice steadily, diligently, unwaveringly. So this is the first sentence. And the next sentence says, now, as you do this, that's it, that's enough. That's sufficient. If you do it correctly, uh, step by step, stage by stage, you will naturally uh, unencumber yourself, see very clearly the nature of things as they are, and find your place in that scheme of things. There's, there's no issue here. However, he is now going to his next point, and uh, I really like this text because it so aptly describes what myself and many people experience when they come to spiritual practice is worry about getting enlightened or not getting enlightened. And we chose to use the word enlightened here in a, a somewhat negative sense um, as it's used as some state that one acquires as opposed to the preferred term is awakening. Awakening is a natural opening up of your understanding, but enlightened is kind of like I got a buyer's market kind of tone to it. And it's the word I like to use when I'm describing the wrong attitude towards it. I want enlightenment. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a craving or a hankering for an altered state of consciousness. So he says both. Don't worry about getting it and don't worry about not getting it. Either way, the worry is unwarranted. And not only is it unwarranted, ironically, the very wanting of it or the fear of not getting it is, in fact, <laughs> the major obstacle for its realization. Yeah. I mean, this sounds kind of funny, but it's the one place sort of in our life where not seeking actually brings it about. And the reason is because the underlying theory of this is it is already whole and complete, naturally within, full. It doesn't have to be added to or taken away from. And the only thing that keeps it from manifesting is our covering it over, our suppressing it, our holding it down through desires, wants, cravings, fears, worries, anxieties, and so forth. So by getting rid of all of those, it just naturally comes up. But if you get rid of all those and then add the worry about not getting it, then you've just, I mean, you get the, the kind of irony of it. Or it's a kind of sad irony. Maybe it's a pathos. Um, just cultivate step by step. This is really good. In every moment of thought, in, in every, you know, some people use breath as a measurement, uh, but breath is, there are probably thousands of millions of thoughts to every breath <laughs> in, in the speed of things. So he's saying in everything you do, every thought, every step, just really do this. And I, that's why we have really do it. Uh, it couldn't be more direct. Uh, I remember uh, when Hung Shur and I started on our bowing pilgrimage, our teacher said, don't worry about when you're going to get there. Don't even worry whether you're going to get there. Uh, and don't worry where you've been. Don't look ahead. Don't look behind. Just pay attention to the here and now, and the false will return to the true. But as soon as you leave the here and now, the true becomes the false. And so then he said, and as far as what you're doing, every step you take be true. <laughs> every step you take be true, and the rest will take care of itself. Um, easy to say, uh, hard to practice, but it's, it's, it's the heart of this advice. Uh, when your skill matures, uh, meaning what? How do you read that? When your skill matures. What is he talking about? Seemingly meditation skill. Uh, maybe something more here? I, I think it's referring to the whole process of what's mentioned before. When your skill of attending to the here and now, getting word of these worldly concerns, not worrying about getting or not getting, when that skill, when that gung fu is just natural and settled, um, you're, and this is, of course, a metaphor, your original face will spontaneously manifest. What does that mean? <laughs> What's your original face? Now, I'm not asking this again as a Chan Koan. I'm just <laughs> asking it in a literary way. What is this referring to? The, the, yeah, 
your essential true nature, what's called the true nature, the, of the, uh, the, the awakened nature, the Buddha nature, uh, the fundamental nature, it is, in fact, human nature, unencumbered, completely freed of any impediments um, or any entanglements, uh, anything that's false. So its original face is just a term they use for, mm, sometimes it's used in, in meditation practices, what was, uh, what was my face, what was my face before I was born? So you, you, you go and ask it that way, and it's very graphic in a sense. You don't say, who was I before I was born? You say, because face is identity. Face is what we think we, you know, there's a lot of identity with the face, or we wouldn't have mirrors. So face is this thing that we look at and identify with, and we spend a lot of time on, and we associate. Um, and nobody, it's really funny, because nobody sees our face the way we do. Um, I often watch people do things with their face or their hair, you know, before they get out of a car or something, you know, like this. And honestly, do you think anybody really notices that you did this or that? <laughs> and most people, most people are unaware of faces, um, except the one in the mirror. So I'm just saying, face is a really good expression here is, who is this that you are before all of these uh, layerings of identity, either cultural or personal, um, and so forth, this will naturally manifest. Basically, it means your true nature will just naturally appear by itself. And that goes back to that, the theory I was expressing. This is already there. It's already whole and complete. Once the covers are lifted off, once the false is let go of, this naturally, spontaneously manifests. And the key word here is spontaneously. It doesn't come through the effort of seeking it and wanting it really badly. So sincerity in cultivation is not quite what sincerity means in the common sense of I really want it. I sincerely want to be admitted to that MBA program. I really, really want her or him or that. That is a kind of um, obsessive yearning, but it's not sincerity. No, sincerely, I mean I really, no, no, it's not the same thing. So here, what he's talking about is when you let go of any of that wanting, craving, seeking, then quite naturally, your nature is free to blossom forth because it requires unobstructed openness for it to manifest. It requires a clear, open space for it to come forth. And anything we put in the way of that keeps it from manifesting. So spontaneously means it comes about of and by itself, on its own, when everything is just natural. So this is the I, spontaneous is to go back and forth with mm, worried about getting, worried about not getting. The worrying is the opposite of the spontaneity. But it isn't to say that it just sort of happens, because that's often a misunderstanding with spontaneity. If I just hang around long enough, maybe at the temple, it'll happen. Well, enlightenment doesn't happen. It happens only when the prerequisites are all in place, and then it happens. So the effort that you apply is not for getting it, but for removing the obstructions preventing its natural manifestation. That's a very different approach. So when you're cultivating, when you're cultivating what you're paying attention to is not the prize, it's what's standing in way of your full human functioning. So you're actually attending to what obstructs. And this is usually garbage. Okay, It's not like, um, it's uh, what we call klesha. It's all the accumulated negative habits of body and mind and emotion that obstruct awakening. And so these are very ordinary things. Jealousy, anger, greed, envy, competitiveness, fear, worry, laziness. Um, overambition, <laughs> go on and on and on. The list is there. They make up all the good novels. Downton Abbey is full of it. Okay, so this is all klesha. The whole thing's driven by klesha. <laughs> it's high class klesha, but it's still klesha. Okay, so klesha is where you're attending and putting your effort. It's not like I'm staring at Guan Yin, and if I stare long enough, wow, sweet dude. No, no, no. It's not going to happen. The very staring is klesha. Because you're, because you're not facing yourself. And so by, even if it seems like it's devout, if you don't get rid of the klesha, there's no awakening. 
It won't happen spontaneously by itself, nor will it happen just because you don't pay attention to anything. <laughs> You've got to be really clear about this. The, the, very, the texts are very clear about this. Awakening is the absence of confusion and thirst and craving. And it can only come about through the removal of those. And that means you go in there and you face them and you acknowledge them and you dig them out. And opportunities that come up when they manifest, a little anger, a little jealousy, a little envy, those are moments of awakening. <laughs> no, 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 they're not. I don't want that. No, those are moments of awakening because that's when you see what's there in the way of your awakening. Well, if she didn't do that to me, no, no. See, that's again, you know, you're going down another road here. If, she, if I got rid of her or him, then I'd be awakened. <laughs> Be, because they're the source of my affliction. And you're going, wow. So I like, yeah, I remember the Buddha said that under the Bodhi tree. He said, man, the only reason I'm getting awakened here is I've gotten rid of everybody. Living beings are boundless, but I got rid of them all, and now I'm awakened. I don't know where that vow is. It's not there. And so, you know, it's right within the kalesha that you find the Bodhi. And so you have to face it. You can't be afraid of it. That's the other thing that people get, af they get afraid of it and then they get the next attitude, if I don't show it, I'm holy. <laughs> because if I don't manifest and I don't show it, then I've got it, right? Don't I look enlightened? I never get mad. I never get jealous. I, well, I do, but I don't show it. That's not it either. Because it's still there. And because it's still there, it's still within the field of intention. And if it's still within the field of intention, it's still creating karma. And you can suffer through it and look like a sage on the outside. And you'll still die confused and unawakened, even though you look holy. <laughs> so it's not a game. It's not an act. It's not something you manifest. Like I, I go to the temple and ah, I'm so easygoing, whatever, you know, Swabian. <laughs> it's not that way. You've really, you really got to go in there and dig it out. Okay? So this, every time it arises, don't get upset with yourself. See, that's the other thing. Start blaming yourself and getting on your case. Because that's the opposite. One way you do it is say, it didn't really happen, that didn't really arise, or it's his or her fault. So that's one way of dealing with it. The other one is, oh, I'm a hopeless sinner, I'll never get there, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So you're either going inferiority or superiority, you know, denial or succumbing, but either one of them doesn't deal with it. You know, if you think of your false habits and thoughts as, as sort of little kids, it really empowers them when you do it that way. You repress them or deny them, they love it. They're still in the driver's seat. So you actually have to go in with a calm and even mind, clinically almost, and say, oh, I just found this cell that's unwell, a cancerous cell, and I need to take it out. Don't cover it over, and don't say, you gave me cancer. Okay, you really ask a question. Yeah, it, for me, what I'm struggling with, with what you're saying, and it sounds like you're trying to address it, is uh, it, it, some of this, at first glance, some of this seems like uh, effort is not required. In fact, effort is antithetical to the outcome maybe that you're seeking or the state of mind that you're trying to develop. Uh, but in my experience, limited experience with doing this now for over a year, it seems to me that this cultivating this state of mind has allowed me a little bit to to make better choices and in those choices i'm i am exerting effort to try and be a better person to try and do things that are more uh in line with i guess you could say my true nature or, you know the, the the best parts of myself so and it's a little bit it, it's a little bit confusing to me at first. Hearing you talk about it more, it, it became more clear. Yeah. Uh, but I think effort is an important part of this. It's just that effort is must be properly placed or in the right context or for the right reasons, I guess. Well, you're, you're answering your own questions, so I, I love those questions. <laughs> People that will answer their own questions, ask more. <laughs> The, the, you're answering half of it. The first half of what I was trying to emphasize is there's something considered proper effort or and improper effort, or um, um, how should we say it? Method, um, effort 
that delivers an effort that is fruitless, futile effort. So effort that is fruitful, effort that is well placed, is effort onto attending to the here and now, attending to your habits and thoughts and watching them, and the difficult part of first acknowledging them, because you can't get rid of them unless you acknowledge them. This is duh, you know, it's, so it sounds duh, but often, you know, somebody says, you know, you, you really got a big temper. Well, what do you mean? I don't, <laughs> whoa, whoa, sorry. <laughs> you know, it, actually acknowledging it is almost halfway there. I mean, it sounds funny, but with the acknowledgement of a fault or a habit, you're halfway there to getting rid of it. So the first part is, and that takes some effort, because yeah. there's a tendency to, to dismiss it, deny it, rationalize it, justify it, yeah. even deify it. <laughs> you know, and so what you want to do is make the effort there to realize, hey, this work isn't going to happen except me doing it on my own ground here. Nobody's going to do this for me. It doesn't work that way. Okay, I'm serious. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to pay attention to this. Just as you go on a diet, you watch what you eat. In the same way you go on this diet, you watch what you think, what you say, what you, you know, that way. But the other part of the effort is, and it's really interesting, and then the wrong effort is, damn it, I want to get enlightened. Or your wrong effort would be, listen, I've been here a year, and I still won't have Anutra, Samyak, Sambodhi. What's with it, this place? <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, that's wrong effort. So the wrong effort he's talking about is seeking the awakening rather than applying the effort to what's obstructing awakening. Now, the other part that is interesting, as you do this, there's a reciprocity going on. So as you use this effort correctly, as you say, you make better choices. And as you make better choices, your mind and your body and your life get a little easier and relaxed, and you see things a little more clearly with less effort. And with that less effort, it, and so it starts a cycle going um, in a process. And after a while, it becomes, and they say, wu wei. And this is a, the Chinese expression, both in Taoism and Buddhism. Wu wei means literally without doing. And it doesn't mean you don't do it. It means it's effortless. Mm -hmm. It doesn't require effort. Because now a new natural has taken over. And you're so attuned to what is healthy and good for you that it's your first response which then doesn't require effort anymore. But that comes with what it says when your skill matures. That's what skill mature means. It starts to become effortless. It starts to become thoughtless. And this is what the patriarchs mean by wuxiang, without thought. It, it doesn't mean mindless. It means now it's so natural, you don't have to even exercise thought to say, this is correct, that's incorrect. You know it here immediately. And that comes with the maturity of this. But it can't come unless you're applying right effort. Because yeah. if your effort's wrongly applying, no matter how long you work at this, well, the text will go on to say, you're going to burn out. That's, that's coming up here. Can I, can I tell you really quick? Sure. My, my perspective on this, my personal experience with this is that before I started doing this, I've been uh, horribly, horribly sad every morning when I every morning as long as I can remember my whole life. And a few years ago, I realized that the rest of my life was as good as I could ever hope it to be. And I still was waking up not feeling well in the morning. And it would take me a while to get feeling right. And I think that the thing that has sort of turned it around for me more recently is that I am putting my effort in the morning to thinking about the people around me, to thinking about what I can do for them. And so I'm applying my effort of thought and action uh, towards somebody else when I'm starting to have those feelings. And uh, that has actually worked. And it, it's, it's uh, I think it, it just resonates extremely well with me with what you're saying in terms of I'm still I am applying effort you're right but I'm not applying effort directly to myself and uh, that seems to have worked a bit of a bit of magic for me right I think my teacher would say it's actually not magic it's method and the method uh, produces any magic that's there no magic comes about except through method when the method is applied, 
then they say the way and the response intertwine. When you apply effort in this way, something happens that's a little bit beyond what you ever imagined could happen. And that's the wondrousness of it, what they describe, because that potential, that human potential to do this, when unleashed and unopened, is much more than we ever imagined. And that's why when uh, sages want to get enlightened, they say, wow, how unexpected that this, this was within me. But you're also on to part of what the Bodhisattva path is about is by making a vow to be concerned with the welfare and the well-being of other living beings. It's not that you're taking necessarily, it seems, focus away from you, but you're actually developing you fuller. So it's, it's not an either or, it's not that there's others in me, but it's an interrelated, non-dual phenomena. And by paying attention to others, you are in fact paying attention to yourself, your true self. And by cultivating that effort to yourself, you are naturally bringing benefit to others. And so after a while, this non-duality of wisdom and compassion worked that way. It's really quite wondrous. So I think in many ways, you're onto it. And the other thing uh, my teacher would say, whatever works, do it. Whatever gets you out of that state in the morning, uh, short of you know, shooting up, uh, works, do it. You know, where you're applying effort on your own ground. Um, at the same time, it's, a, it's an interesting place to pay attention to. Um, some of the texts talk about this. In our busy lives, the way we live, we spend a lot of time grasping, frantically searching and seeking, and in a kind of state of psychological and cultural denial, because we're busy. We're really busy. And that busyness seems to solve a lot of problems that we would have to listen to our face if we weren't so busy. And so busyness starts to come as a compensation for feelings of inadequacy, insecurity, or angst, dukkha. But then over time, they become so self-fulfilling, so self-sustaining, we no longer think we're busy. But when we fall asleep, just those wee hours before falling asleep, and those wee hours just as we're waking up, there comes a moment of space when the busyness hasn't quite kicked in. And all that sort of unexamined space is still there coming up. So the trick is, it can be a moment of kind of an encounter with a teacher. So tell me what's going on. What's going on? Where is this coming from? What's that about? Or it can be a moment of overwhelming. And so you have to kind of play with it. If it can become a moment of some insight and reflection, and you can feel that that happened, then you can spend some time there. But if it starts to move you into a negative space where you don't have handle on it, then you do whatever you do to get yourself out of it. So it's, it's not an either or. Sometimes being in those spaces can be a very reflective, insightful place. And then sometimes it's too much for anybody. And so you have to, when it says get rid of all worldly concerns, you do this in a way that you stay balanced as a person. You know, the monks here, when they go forth, they get rid of a lot of worldly things. Yeah, well, I could just say tonight we're going to lock the doors and we're all going to shave everybody's head and take away your connections to the outside world and you'll be free, right? No. <laughs> Most of you would go, well, 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 but, 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 you know, you're not, you're not ready. That's so worldly concerns for one, one person is the balanced life of another. And you have to figure that out for yourself. This is not a black and white thing, getting rid of worldly concerns. Because usually what that means is I get rid of what I don't like. And then I keep the worldly concerns I like, and now I'm free. You know? <laughs> so that's not what it means. What it means is bit by bit, in this way, balanced, sane, in good health, look at what's encumbering, what's impeding, and gradually move it out. Move it out of your space. Move it out of your table. And increase those things that move you the other direction. But do it in a balanced and sane way. Do not be imitating someone else's. As Emerson said, uh, there comes a time in every person's education when they arrive at the conviction that envy is ignorance and imitation is suicide. Okay? This is true in cultivation as well. You follow the method that the Buddha laid down, but you just don't go right now uh, up to Tilden and sit for 49 nights and days under a tree thinking that that's going to do it. By the time the Buddha got to do that, there had been a lot of work done and a lot of ground cleared. Okay? Um, most people say, well, I could do that if I could keep my iPhone. No, you don't even take your iPhone under the tree. Ooh, 
Well, then I don't know. <laughs> so when it says do this, it means do it in a way where you don't lose balance. Uh, let's turn to this Confucian text. I, I like that. Um, I, I didn't know when I was going to use it. Now it seems a good time. We have that. There we go. Uh, Iwan, do you know where this is from? Here's your test. Huh? No, no, it's not from Mencius. That's okay. It's from the Dash, right? Okay, this is one of the Confucian texts. Now, some people think Confucianism only has to do with your social relationships, blah, 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 and, and state government control, and blah, blah, blah. But actually, um, the good Confucian scholars I know, uh, and if you read the text closely, you'll see that it is both external and internal. It's about how you deal with your external relationships, husband to wife, uh, uh, friends, sisters and brothers, and so forth, but it's also about self-cultivation. And in this, uh, this text, is, it's called the Dashwe, meaning called translate the great learning, but what it means is self-knowledge, what Socrates meant by know yourself. And so this great, this higher learning, he says, begins with, very interesting, resides in making your virtue and your character whole and complete, and then investigating things, and being very attuned to what is the cause and effect in your relationships in your life and so forth. So this passage he's taking, um, he says, okay, so if your wish is you want to make the world a better place, then you have to work with your own ground, your own country. You're working in your own country, of course, you'd have to go back and work on your own family. And if you want to make your family a sort of a model for a good world, then you better start working on yourself. And if you want to work on yourself, then you have to, um, and then he says, you have to get your mind right. And so this passage now says, well, what is meant by the cultivation of your person depends on getting your mind right, straightening your mind. And he says, cultivation of the person depends on rectifying or straightening, balancing the mind, may thus be illustrated. And here's his quote. If a person is under the influence of passion, he will be, and this is translated, this is a translation, incorrect in his conduct. But the character here is not Jung. I can't have a pointer. Can anybody point to the Jung? Bring out your laser. Don't put in your eyes. That's <laughs> one. <laughs> Can you curse her over it or something? Jung. Got it? So it's, it's a character that is translated in many ways. Some people translate it as morally correct, right, proper, but it's actually based on an, um, a pictorial base here, and that's the, it's a carpenter square. So it's, it's meant to be that which is aligned and balanced, that which is as it should be, appropriate. So what he says here, if, you go, if you're under the influence of your passion, you won't get junk. You won't be centered, balanced, and in, in, in a good position. Um, if the same will apply if you're under the influence of terror. Now, terror means fear, worry, anxiety. You won't get the jung. If you're under the influence of fond regard, infatuation, um, being enamored by, you won't get jung. If you're under that of sorrow and distress, you won't get jung. So what he's saying here is, if you have these emotions ruling you or these feelings ruling you, then you won't be able to make the right decisions. You won't be in a place to get the right feedback because these distort. They take you out of that position. So to see this connection here, going back to what we were saying, Han Chan is saying, if you're seeking enlightenment or worried about not getting enlightenment, you won't get junk. If you are thinking, I don't have to pay attention to my faults and bad habits, you won't get junk. If you think I can just um, pray them away, or mortify my flesh and they'll go away, or blame them on somebody else, they'll go, you won't get junk. So there's a carryover here. 
the rectification of the mind means you have to be aware of how the emotions and the passions influence how you perceive, how you understand, and how you see. When the mind is not present, we look and do not see. We hear and do not understand. We eat and do not know the taste of what we eat. <laughs> I love this. So when the mind is not attuned, see, this, this is very interesting because this is Confucian. The Buddha would even say, more so you have to be attuned. You do not cultivate by tuning out. So when you say, I'm in samadhi, you better be in a samadhi that's totally aware of everything that's going on, or it's not a samadhi. More importantly, you better be aware of what's going on within you. So that's samadhi. Samadhi means unimpeded awareness. It doesn't mean zoned out. And it means equanimity within the awareness. Because <laughs> most of us can be aware, but it's overwhelming. <laughs> okay? And most of us can be unaware, but then it's numbing out. So to be totally aware and not overwhelmed, that's samadhi. Oh, damn, I thought I would. No, it doesn't. Work. So what he's saying, though, is if you are not present in that your present state of mind, you're not present in your state of mind, you won't be seen. You won't even see what's there. And you won't even hear what's there. And you won't even know the food, taste of the food you eat. So it actually is contrary to what people think. Cultivation is not a numbing down of your sensitivities. It's actually a rarefying and heightening of them. It's attuning them to the degree to which the slightest thing that's off hits you like a hurricane wave. So, you know, if you're at that stage, killing something is like cosmic shattering of your consciousness at that point. It's so, gr it's so crude, it's so powerfully negative that even the thought of anger that would precede that was more than you could stomach. So this cultivationing means you increase your sensitivities, you increase your natural abilities. This is where shantung comes from. Shantung meaning psychic powers are not supernatural. They're an extension refinement of the natural. And what seems to be supernatural is just because we are so not seen, not present. If we were fully present, these would naturally be there in our capacity as human beings. So this is really pretty cool. There's, an, there's another part where Confucius goes on and he says, so when you get present and you've rectified your mind, naturally you're able to be with people in a very wholesome and effortless way. Why? Because you know what they're feeling and thinking before they say it. Oh, shantung? No! It's like, duh. You have this ability to you just read somebody's body language. You, it's there all the time, it's, but we don't see it. Why? Well, I'm thinking about myself. Yeah, of course, you're not going to see anything if you're self-centered. So, and then he says, not only will that happen, but you'll be able to see changes in the weather before they manifest. Now, he's getting kind of scientific here. He's saying you'll be able to sense changes in pressure, what we now would call barometric pressure. You'll be able to observe the behaviors of animals and plants and little insects and know the patterns of the weather before they arrive. Oh, that's interesting. Like, what, this 2,000-some years old, this text. This is before meteorology. So what he's talking about, though, is not spiritual. It's a fulfillment of the human. So that's why my teacher would say, you know, you want to become a Buddha or Bodhisattva. There's only one way to get there is to fulfill and perfect your humanity. There's no other path. And that's what this is all talking about. That's where the effort uh, is rightly applied. Okay. So I like to bring in these texts every once in a while to show correspondence that this is not just a one-dimensional. Um, let's just look at this part, we'll, and then we'll come back to it next week, because he's going on. If one <clears throat> vainly yearns for enlightenment, this very longing forms the root of birth and rebirth. Till the end of time, you will not gain awakening in this way. Why? Because you are still longing for the true mind, thinking it is something outside. And this is a really important passage because it's one of the markers whether you're applying effort correctly. Such longing will quickly wear you out and cause you to falter and come up short. Just, and I love this line, just like when you cannot find what you're looking for, you want to simply give up. That, that's such a beautiful, where is it? I know it's somewhere, I put it somewhere and you're, you're looking and you're looking, you're wearing yourself on and finding you give up on it. Um, but that, that metaphor describing if you're seeking for enlightenment because you can't possibly get it in seeking,
But you'll work and work and work until you finally get so frustrated that you'll just throw, up the, throw in the towel and give up. When in fact, it was a wasted effort from the outset because there was no way it was going to deliver if you're seeking enlightenment. Uh, so this, this we'll come back to and spend some time next week, but I wanted to finish that section for you. You can see where he was going with it. And it's very pragmatic in, the, in a philosophical sense, meaning it doesn't deliver, okay? If seeking enlightenment delivered, then the text would say, go do it, because it works. What it's saying here is, it doesn't work. It's not like it's theoretically wrong or doctrinally wrong. It just doesn't work. It doesn't instrumentally bring the results you hope for. So this is a very pragmatic teaching. This is coming from experiential knowledge, saying, we have tried, we have seen, and we have experimented with going after it in this way, and it doesn't. And we have seen that when you let go of this, paradoxically, it does. So therefore, we recommend you to try this method rather than this way of yearning and seeking for it or seeking it outside and so forth. Really good, really straightforward. Yeah. This is really good. These questions now are really good. The reason this is really good is ex exactly where Han Shan's going in the next passage. <laughs> so, with the, yeah, I know. Last night, the passage we translated is exactly your question that he answers. So, rather than me stick my foot in my mouth and try to give an answer, um, I'm going to tell you come back next week <laughs> <laughs> and see what Han Shan has to say about it because he addresses that very question. It's very interesting. It's sort of like you're, you're in the, the flow of this somehow. But at the same time, it might be that these are the natural questions that would come up to any human being who's doing this. And so in some way, his mapping out of this follows the natural inclination of the mind opening to itself, the mind unfolding to its own questions and understandings. So I can answer just briefly, he's going to say they're not two, they're one. And their only difference is how you use them the ordinary mind and the true mind. But see what he says next week. It's really, really interesting. And this would require patience. <laughs> okay, so we'll stop here for tonight. Um, any announcements? Yes. There's lots of snails where? On the, on the steps? I hope someone then some French person leave it as a food offering. <laughs> no? <laughs> Escargot natural. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so please uh, don't make crunchy crunchies when you go out. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you. I, I'm not I'm not making fun. I think that's actually, you know, your point, Megan, is uh, why um, in our tradition in the Buddhist tradition living home, they say, how many rains have you gone forth? And it goes back to the tradition that uh, in the past, the monastics wandered. There wasn't any monasteries. They just wandered. And then when the rains came, um, the snails <laughs> and all the other creatures came out because of the water and the drowning, and they would seek ground where they were safe, which is usually the highway. And then walking on there, you would end up killing a lot of them. So the rain's retreats came about uh, both on the necessity of the, everybody gathering for a little bit. Because you're out wandering on, the, on your own for a whole year. You can get kind of weird. So it's good to come back with all your fellow cultivators and say, you know, you need a bath. And you need to stop staring at the sun. And you need to wear clothes. And <laughs> get everybody adjusted back on. But it also kept them from harming living beings during that rains retreat, so it had a dual function. So actually, we're in the rains now, and this is what happens in the rains. Also, the ants will start to move and uh, enter your bedroom or your kitchen or, yeah. 
Okay. Anything else? Okay, we'll do the transference. to the teachers. 